when I agreed to do this, I didn't know my former colleague from the State Department, Warren Clark, was going to be leading the session. So it's a double pleasure for me not only to, to be part of this, but Warren to introduce you and, and let you talk about this intriguing topic of barriers right. to resolving the Israeli-Palestinian right. Right. We just talked about water as one of them. Indeed, yeah. indeed. It, it's, it's, it's one of the essential uh, over to, over topics. To you, Thank you, Rich. Thank you so much. Uh, Nucci, it's very good to see you here uh, today. And my wife, Betsy, and uh, so, so many friends. Um, we have 30 minutes uh, to cover an enormous topic uh, that's taken uh, deca decades and, and generations. Uh, so I will, uh, I'll try to move quickly through it and f focus really on, on uh, just the last uh, few uh, years and months and even uh, this week. Um, but briefly, uh, the uh, negotiations uh, between these Israelis and the Palestinians um, have been uh, transformed uh, in, in the last few years. Uh, for a long time, the dispute really was between two peoples over one land. Uh, it was who was going to have the land. Uh, uh, the um, uh, the uh, Zionists, uh, the, uh, the, the Jews from, from, from Europe, of course, were escaping uh, persecution uh, from Russia in the 19th century and, of course, the Holocaust with the Nazis in the 20th century um, and started uh, immigration in the late 19th century into uh, what later became the British Mandate of Palestine. The British, uh, in their famous Balfour Declaration, 1917, uh, set up a contradiction, uh, something that was totally unworkable. They said, well, they would look upon, uh, with favor on the homeland for the Jewish people, provided it didn't interfere with the rights of the uh, native people. Uh, this, of course, uh, was, was not possible. There were already partition plans between the First World War and the Second World War. Uh, finally, there was a partition plan in 1947, voted by the UN General Assembly. Uh, which was rejected uh, by the Arabs. Uh, all the Arab, neighboring Arab countries, they declared war uh, in 1948 um, and uh, ended up with a, an armistice. So there was no agreement uh, on sharing the land uh, and only a, a war that ended with an armistice without a, a, a fixed international boundary. Uh, since then, uh, there have been a whole series of wars, as I'm sure you know, in 1956, 1967, 1973, uh, and all the time it really was between uh, various Arab states uh, and the state of Israel uh, with the objection, the stated objection by many uh, Arab states of, of eliminating Israel, of pushing uh, the, the Israelis uh, back, uh, back to Europe, uh, back uh, into the sea. And it was only in the last couple of decades that people really started talking about sharing uh, the land uh, by coming up with a border, a real border, an internationally recognized uh, border. Uh, it was only um, in as recently as uh, 1993 uh, that the PLO, the Palestine Liberation Organization, agreed to recognize the right of the state of Israel to exist. Uh, and it was only um, after that, uh, about 10 years later, that uh, President George W. Bush uh, 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 um, uh, supported the idea of what's called the two-state solution. That is, you create a Palestinian state living side by side with the state of Israel in, in peace and security. Uh, there were a series of negotiations that went on about what that kind of peace might look like, what the border might look like. Uh, and there were about four or five final status issues that were discussed in Camp David here in, in 2000, uh, later in, in, in Geneva. Uh, they are borders. Uh, security, uh, refugees, and Jerusalem. And many people would add water as a, as a fifth. And indeed, these days you might look upon recognition of Israel as a Jewish state as even a fifth uh, or sixth uh, uh, final status issue. Uh, these negotiations have gone off and on uh, with uh, uh, getting tantalizingly close uh, to an agreement. Uh, they really weren't terribly close in 2000 at Camp David although they outlined the, the basis of an agreement. But it turns out, we have found out later, that the two sides got very close uh, only four years ago. In 2008, uh, there were negotiations after a, a, a summit in Annapolis uh, between the Prime Minister uh, of Israel, a fellow named Olmert at the time, and his foreign minister, Zippy Livni, uh, and uh, Mahmoud Abbas. 
Uh, and they came really very close uh, to an agreement on all the basic elements so that uh, experts who follow these things kind of know what an agreement is going to look like. The problem is getting there. The problem is that last mile, that, that covering the last, uh, the, the last uh, little bit. And that has always been an impossible task. I think in part because people think both sides really, they kind of wonder whether both sides really believe it, whether they really are willing to, to, uh, to support the two-state solution, even though they say they do. Uh, for example, there was a party, a Congress, the Likud party, uh, last month, uh, in which Prime Minister Netanyahu said, well, he continues to support the expansion of settlements into the land of Israel. Well, the land of Israel, uh, capitals, letters, uh, is, is the West Bank. Uh, that's what the, some people call the biblical names of Judea and Samaria. And the settlement enterprise, the enterprise of expanding the Israeli population uh, into the West Bank by building settlements, uh, sometimes outposts, which are kind of just sometimes a couple of uh, 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 buildings on a, on a, uh, on a hilltop, uh, has, has continued uh, and indeed has accelerated as these negotiations uh, have been going on. And um, it was only this week uh, that a new uh, uh, group of uh, 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 housing was, was announced, the plans to, to build a new set of housing uh, in the West Bank. Today, you've got a, a, a mixture. You've got uh, of, of Israelis living next to Palestinians uh, all through, almost all through uh, the West Bank. Uh, the West Bank population uh, of Palestinians uh, is about 2.4 million. Uh, there are uh, over 300,000 uh, Israeli settlers now uh, in the West Bank, uh, which comes to something like 13% uh, of, of the population. Uh, and many people think it would be impossible uh, with that many people living in the West Bank for them to uh, pick up and move and go back uh, to, uh, to Israel if you were ever to, ever to have a settlement. Um, so the question arises, uh, is the two-state solution, which the U.S. government has been supporting in these past uh, uh, 10 years or so, is the two-state solution really possible? Well, um, uh, we have this problem of the mixtures of the population. Uh, there's also the problem of Jerusalem, uh, which is terribly important. Uh, the uh, standard view uh, is that if, you can, if you're going to have a Palestinian state, East Jerusalem has to be the capital of a Palestinian state because that's the focus of, of faith, uh, of intense uh, uh, political uh, concern. Uh, the, uh, the city of, of East Jerusalem was a Palestinian uh, city, uh, part of Jerusalem, uh, up until 1967. Uh, and indeed, the population is still in East Jerusalem, uh, predominantly uh, Palestinian, although uh, the boundaries of the city were extended in 1967 uh, from West Jerusalem to include East Jerusalem, and it was declared to be the uni united and eternal capital of Israel. So uh, the position of the government is there cannot be uh, an Israeli, a uh, Palestinian uh, capital in, in East Jerusalem, that that's going to remain, uh, remain Israeli. Uh, at the same time, there have been intense construction uh, projects uh, by the Israelis in little areas around uh, East Jerusalem. There were a whole series of them announced just in the last four or five months uh, since uh, last fall. And if you look at a map of, of Jerusalem and East Jerusalem, these communities can be seen as sort of forming barriers around uh, East Jerusalem and cutting off access uh, from East Jerusalem to uh, the rest of the Palestinian territories. So if these communities are all built uh, in the next two or three years, which is what the plan is, uh, the, you will be in a situation where you can't get there from here. Uh, you, you can't have a contiguous uh, state uh, of the uh, uh, Palestinian that includes East Jerusalem. And if East Jerusalem is not going to be the capital of the Palestinian state, uh, a lot of people say there, there simply will not be one, there will not be an agreement, the Palestinians will not agree. And it's not just a question of the Palestinians. All Muslims around the world, just like all Christians and Jews, feel very intensely about Jerusalem, so do Muslims uh, around uh, the world feel very intensely about uh, Jerusalem, especially East Jerusalem, and especially the Temple Mount, uh, where uh, uh, the Dome of the Rock and the, uh, uh, the Mosque of uh, Omar are, uh, are located. Uh, <clears throat> so um, this is another reason that some people say it's, it's impossible to have a, uh, uh, the, the two-state solution. Uh, on the other hand, uh, what's the alternative 
to a two-state solution. Um, if you think about a one-state solution, uh, what would that look like? Would it be a democratic state? Well, if it's a democratic state, if you look at the, the, the population today of Israel, the West Bank, uh, Jerusalem, uh, and Gaza, and you count up the Jews, the Israeli citizens in Israel and uh, these other places, and you count up the Palestinian residents in Israel, of which there are uh, one and a half million, uh, and the West Bank and these other areas, they come out almost exactly the same. There are about 5.5 million uh, Jews in this whole area, Israelis, and about uh, uh, the same number, 5.5 uh, million uh, uh, Arab uh, Palestinians. Um, so that if you had a, a single state that was democratic, goodness, you would have a parliament that was about half and half. Okay, uh, what would the name of the, of the state be? <laughs> Israel hyphen Palestine? Or, yeah. uh, what about, there's an Israeli law of the return. Uh, Jews from all over the world are welcome back uh, to become citizens of Israel. What about the Palestinians? What about a Palestinian? The right of return of, of Palestinians who fled as refugees in 1948 and again in 1967 is an enormous issue. Um, and uh, would they have the right of return? Well, if that's going to happen, uh, uh, the, the Israelis are very fearful that that would be, in effect, the end of, of Israel. It would be the end of the Zionist dream of a Jewish majority state, especially a Jewish majority democratic state. Um, so that the, the one-state solution uh, is deeply, uh, people are deeply suspicious of that uh, in, in Israel uh, because uh, it looks as though it's a, an effort to, to overwhelm uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the Jewish population of, of Israel. I should add that the birth rate of Palestinians is higher than the birth rate of, of, of Israelis as, as a whole. So that if you project out uh, 10 or 20 years, uh, there wouldn't be just an even population. There might, be, in fact, be a, a, an Arab a majority population in, in the whole area. So if that's the case, um, uh, why aren't they, uh, why aren't they uh, getting together? What, are the, uh, what, what, what barriers uh, are there uh, still to, to getting the, the two sides uh, together? Um, uh, apart um, uh, from the distrust, um, apart from the, um, uh, from the history, there is this enormous, I think, uh, inertia, this enormous momentum. Um, people are looking at what's going to happen today, this week, next month. They're not looking forward to what's going to happen five years from now. It's a very short-term time horizon. So that you can say, well, but you really, to the Israeli government, to the Palestinian government, you really should be looking down the road and do you really want to be in a situation uh, five years from now, ten years from now, where Israel still has no recognized border, where you have an Israeli uh, political, military, economic domination of one ethnic group over another ethnic group, uh, the, uh, the Palestinians? Sort of the Rhodesian solution where you have two societies living intermixed with other, with one dominating the other? That certainly is not democracy. Um, or it's democracy, democracy for some people, but, but not, for, not for other people. Um, uh, what about Israel's concern for its legitimacy? It's not recognized by most Arab uh, and Muslim countries uh, in the world. Uh, it is increasingly isolated politically uh, from countries that it used to have good relations with, Egypt and, and, and Turkey. Uh, the, uh, uh, the Europeans are very impatient with Israel for continuing the the settlement expansion, which works against uh, the, uh, the two-state solution. So that uh, does Israel want to, want to be, uh, 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 in that sense, politically isolated? Um, well, the answer is, if the answer is no, if Israel is going to uh, uh, be uh, recognized, accepted uh, in the world, if there's going to be a, a two-state solution, can you get there from here? Uh, and the answer is yes. If there's a political desire to do so, if people feel the need to do so, they certainly can. Um, the problem is right now that uh, a lot of people, uh, uh, certainly on the Israeli side, are, feel secure. Uh, they're, uh, they're, they're comfortably off uh, economically. And uh, they don't feel the, the need uh, to, to change uh, and go through the very painful cost of, of, of moving people if they, if they had to move people. 
But if you were going to do it, if someone decided to do that, how would you go about it? Well, one thing you can do is simply start to wind down the subsidies. All this uh, 300 and odd uh, thousand uh, Israelis living in, in the Palestinian territories, not all of them, but many of them are living in communities that are heavily, heavily subsidized by the Israeli government. Uh, a young couple can uh, get rent an apartment or buy an apartment um, uh, in, uh, in some of these settlements for about half of the cost of living in uh, Tel Aviv uh, or, or Jerusalem. Uh, so that if there's a, a winding down of the subsidies, there could be a gradual uh, incentive for people to move uh, back, uh, back uh, to Israel. Uh, <clears throat> there are other uh, mechanisms in place that uh, encourage the, uh, uh, the settlement expansion, which, which could be changed. Uh, one of the extraordinary um, phenomenon in Israel is the, the, the enormous growth of state subsidies for religious uh, institutions and religious studies. Uh, there are now tens of thousands uh, in Israel uh, who are benefiting from subsidies uh, to be what's called the ortho, orth, ultra-Orthodox uh, communities. Uh, the men uh, study uh, almost sometimes all their lives. They're not gainfully employed. <laughs> um, uh, sometimes they have jobs uh, working in, in, uh, in kosher food places or so forth, but many of them simply, simply study and, and teach on very, very small uh, subsidies uh, from the government or very small uh, stipends. Uh, these uh, uh, subsidies have continued and have been increased because the political parties that represent this group are an important part of the coalition uh, in the government. Uh, and there's an increasing it's extraordinary that, that, that back 50 years ago, many people would have been very surprised, certainly the founding generation of Zionists would have been surprised, to think that religion was becoming so important uh, in, in the politics of, of the state of Israel. Because most of the Zionists, the founders, were, were secular. They were not uh, particularly religious people. They were attached more to, to socialist, uh, secular socialist principles uh, coming, coming from Europe. Uh, so the, uh, the growth of, of, of the ties between uh, growing religious groups and, and the state uh, is producing a, a situation where uh, these people are now, uh, the, the ultra-Orthodox ultra and religious, are, are taking on more and more positions of importance uh, in the army, for example, uh, to the point where people are worried that uh, if the government tries to force uh, settlers to move back, that the, it's not clear that uh, the army units would, uh, would, would, would go along with that. So there's a tension, there's an undermining of the authority of the state uh, because of the growth of the of the influence of uh, uh, of some of these uh, some of these groups, well, where does that leave us right now? Um, uh, we, you're all aware, are in an election year here in the United States, um, and uh, it's it's clear it seems clear that the United States government is probably not going to take any kind of major initiative uh, in the next in the next several months. Uh, the, Obama, the Obama administration has tried very hard. I think when it came into uh, when it came into power uh, in uh, in 2009, to make a, an agreement between Israel and the Palestinians a priority from the beginning of the administration, uh, President Obama appointed uh, George Mitchell. Uh, they had very other high-powered people who were working on this on this project, uh, but and they started on focusing on settlements. That it's a contradiction to in, be expanding settlements if you really want to create a, a Palestinian, a viable, contiguous Palestinian state. And that struggle went on uh, for, for months. Uh, the Israelis had a temporary uh, freeze on some of the construction in the West Bank. Um, uh, they would not include East Jerusalem, which of course is, is very important. Um, and they were, at the end, there was a sort of a de facto freeze in East Jerusalem that wasn't announced uh, for a number of months. And negotiations uh, began between the Palestinians and the Israelis. Um, and um, then the, uh, that uh, expired, and uh, settlements uh, construction uh, began again. So the, the Obama administration has uh, not been possible to, uh, to slow down the settlement expansion, not been possible to move the two sides toward an agreement. Um, after the elections uh, this year, um, and next year perhaps, there may be, there may be time for more um, uh, political innovation. Uh, to try to get uh, the two sides uh, together. In the meantime, there are many groups, uh, both within Israel and, and in the Palestinian territories, uh, that are trying to, to promote um, uh, an agreement, trying to promote human rights, trying to discuss water, 
uh, and these other issues uh, to try to uh, 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 reduce the, uh, the tensions and the problems uh, that, uh, that exist. But the continued expansion of, of the settlements, as I mentioned, with some were just announced this week, uh, makes that uh, increasingly difficult. So I'll stop there and see if we have any questions. Yeah, well, let's take a few questions. Uh, I know we're <laughs> sort of standing between you and lunch uh, now, but uh, I think, Warren, you may, you know, since there's nothing else going on in this room, you don't have to feel really pressed uh, unless, unless your stomach's are I'm fine. Otherwise. So if you please, just uh, identify yourself uh, and uh, fire away at Warren. Please. Sure. Uh, Ari Ayafrat, I'm ready. Uh, uh, I agree with you that the settlement in the West Bank is very to the, to the two-state solution. That's absolutely true and it's absolutely correct. But you, make it, you made it sound, in my opinion, as if that is the root cause of the conflict and if only the settlements went away, everything will be fine. Um, there is, in Israel at least, there is the feeling that the root cause of the conflict is that there is no Palestinian leader who is willing to go down in history as the person who signed the agreement to give away half of Palestine. Uh, and as long as there won't be a leader who would be signing such an agreement, that conflict will continue with settlements or no settlements. What is your I agree with your point, and I, 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 I should have been more clear about that. The settlements are only one side, one part of the problem. Um, I think uh, another part of the problem that's, that's hard to quantify is fear. Uh, the fear of, of history, uh, the fear of the memories of the Holocaust, uh, the fear of being attacked. I mentioned the wars in, in 48 and 49. Um, and the genuine fear of, of rockets uh, coming in from, from Gaza, from South Lebanon. Uh, now fear of, uh, of Iran. Uh, all these things make Israel very, uh, understandably, very, very cautious about, uh, about their, their, their security. Um, on the question of leadership, uh, however, I think we've seen a, a very important transition in the last 10 years uh, from Yasser Arafat, um, who was sort of a charismatic political person, but not terribly keen on uh, on, uh, first of all, controlling uh, violence in the West Bank. And he was, there were a lot of sort of independent militias under him in the West Bank that were out of control, especially during the, the horrible uh, Second Intifada, uh, which led to uh, suicide bombings and, and, and terrible, terrible atrocities. Uh, and he was not able to do, not able to control that, or he, maybe he, whether he wanted to or not, he was not able to control it. But when he died and was replaced eventually by Abbas, uh, this also came in with a, a, the so-called roadmap that was set up by George W. Bush. Um, and he was replaced by uh, Mahmoud Abbas, who has put his, all his political marbles, uh, his chips, into cooperation with Israel and with the United States. Uh, first of all, on security. Um, and uh, as you may know, the U.S. has a big training program now for policemen uh, in, uh, in the West Bank. Uh, there is uh, law and order has been established uh, to a high degree in the West Bank. There now is almost for the first time one gun and one law uh, in, in the West Bank that has been uh, established with the help of the United States and Israel uh, for, the, uh, for the Palestinians. So I think um, uh, Abbas sincerely wants to get a deal, uh, if he can, uh, with, uh, with, with Israel. Uh, part of the problem... Uh, is the asymmetry. Uh, Israel is very powerful in almost every way. The Palestinians are quite poor and weak in almost every way. And the, um, so simply saying to the two sides, okay, you go into a room and negotiate a deal, you're probably not going to get a deal because uh, the Palestinians fear uh, that uh, there will be no motive uh, for uh, uh, for Israel to, to give in on Jerusalem, for example, or these, these other uh, kinds of issues. And they'll never, they'll never get their sort of minimum demands. So the Palestinians is, have, have had conditions. They've said, okay, we'll, we'll negotiate with you if you stop the exp settlement expansion, or if you will agree to negotiate on the basis of the 1960s of seven lines. That's what um, uh, President Obama said last, last May. Uh, because if you start negotiating on the basis of 67 lines, that implies an end to the expansion settlements, and it implies uh, that some arrangement will be worked out for, uh, for Jerusalem. So uh, I, think, I think probably Israel has 
the best kind of interlocutor uh, in, in Mahmoud Abbas, as one could imagine, realistically, uh, in, a, in, a, in a Palestinian negotiator. I, I, think, I think there is a partner for, for peace there, uh, if we can overcome some of these other uh, problems. I've got two questions that I'm aware of here, and then back there, and then I've got four questions, please. Hi, my name is Fahira, and I'm a Palestinian citizen of Israel. And thank you for all this, uh, like to map all the situation, especially to someone who live in that uh, area and really affected daily from all the political process happening inside Israel and its effect especially to the Palestinian minority inside Israel. And I have been working long time in dialogue to create shared society inside Israel. And I have been believing that the change will come from Israel inside Israel. But in the last uh, few years, I began to believe that the, the, the Jewish majority blind are living in very relaxed way and don't want to give up the occupation situation. Now, I want to create shared society with Jews but I feel that I need help from outside. I began to believe that just international pressure will help me to create this uh, shared space. Now, I want you to help me where to put my energy, how, what is the role of the international pressure, especially in the United States, what we can do in order to move this situation from escalation, because I, be, I feel that Jews don't want to, to go for two-state solution, and in the same time, more, more, uh, more uh, unsolving of the, the, the conflict creates in the field. Like, there is no, we are just going for a place that there is no, no resolution for this conflict. And I want your help, like, where to put my, my energy. As I mentioned, because of the, the, the asymmetry of, of power, uh, most people uh, think that the two parties cannot work out an agreement just between themselves. Someone's going to have to help them uh, work out an agreement. And almost universally, people think that would be the United States, because only the United States has the resources and, and the credibility to, to do that. Um, as I mentioned, uh, the Obama administration tried, uh, and, and we're, we're not successful in the first uh, two or three years. Uh, and uh, perhaps uh, we hope they will, they will uh, try again when, when the circumstances uh, uh, permit. Um, that's what I do. Uh, my job is to, is I'm, I'm the head of something called Churches for Middle East Peace. We do education and advocacy uh, on this issue. Uh, we try to inform people about what's going on. We try to urge the administration to uh, exert leadership and, and help both sides uh, to, uh, to, to come to an agreement. One of the things the administration always starts with and must always start with is security. Uh, that unless Israel is, is assured on its, on its uh, military and other kinds of security, it won't, it won't do anything. But I think uh, a large number of people now believe uh, that uh, security is not just with land. Uh, that, you know, the fact that Israel has a very narrow uh, border in the, in the center uh, is not determinant on, on, on whether it is secure or not. Um, and that it doesn't need a border uh, on the Jordan River uh, to be uh, to be uh, secure, uh, in fact, um, it may be less secure if if uh, if it doesn't have an agreement with with with, with its neighbors. Uh, what can be done in Israel? I think there are a number of groups uh, that you probably are, are familiar with um, uh, in um, um, in Haifa and, and other places uh, that are working on on human rights, on civil rights, uh, on trying to uh, work towards um, uh, e more 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 equal access. On the part of uh, the uh, the uh, Arab citizens of Israel to to education, to housing, to jobs, there's a lot of discrimination. A lot of people don't realize this. Yes, Israel's a democracy, but yes, it's also there's a lot of discrimination uh, and lack of opportunity for the um, for the Arab minority. We take uh, the quick quick question. So, well, I I have uh, to protest first. I linking uh, the Palestinian, like, or talking about the Holocaust with the Palestinian issue, it has nothing to do, to do the, with the Palestinian. The Holocaust is a crime against the humanity, uh, was in Europe, and has nothing to do with the Palestinian. This is the first thing. Uh, this is, has to be clear, okay? The second issue, it feels that the Palestinian has the F-16s, the Palestinian have the Markaba, and the Palestinian and the Palestinian, and the Israelis need security. Well, look at it. They are starving people with less than $1,000 a year. How can these will fight nuclear superpower? 
Think about it that way. Why you say always Israel security of Israel, security of Israel. The gentleman downstairs was talking about the Arab Spring and talk about it from point of view of Israel, 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 Israel. There is also Palestinian has their rights, has their national rights. The Palestinians are not Mahmoud Abbas. The Palestinians are not Yasser Arafat. They have wide range of opinion from Hamas to Marxist, Leninist, whatever you want to call it. Why Israel is okay if Prime Minister of Israel signed? Well, the Palestinians, they will doubt it. Simply, this is unacceptable discrimination. Thank you. Uh, I I, 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 would, I would agree that the European Holocaust has, has nothing to do with the Palestinians, uh, but it has a lot to do with the Israelis. I think it has a lot to do with, with the, 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 the mind, uh, with the feelings. And if, if there is to be an agreement, uh, I think uh, both sides have to feel comfortable with the agreement. Uh, and that's why I think uh, security for both sides, including uh, Israel, is, is, has to be an important part of the agreement. Yeah, but, but Israel but, has not. Right. Just need to get the other two questions over here. Yeah, right. I was just going to make the same comment he made. You know, children going to school, they also have fears of being shot or being, or, or just random people being detained without a charge for no reason, absolutely no reason, for so many years and nobody cares about that. There was a case just this week of, of a guy under administrative detention, that means no habeas corpus, uh, who went on a hunger strike. Uh, and um, uh, was uh, under under certain amount of political pressure was was uh, was promised to be released. So yes, there is administrative detention, uh, which means you're not charged, uh, and um, you can be held for uh, for long periods of time. But other than that, they just they're suffering. They all the Israelis they want okay. They want the rockets to stop, you know, hitting them. They want. Um, their own half of the country or whatever, but the Palestinians they also want their sovereignty. They don't feel that it's it's not it's not it's not they don't have the basic human rights. Simple as that. I think it's in everybody's interest, in the world's interest, the United States interest, uh, to to achieve that, to to achieve a, a viable, contiguous, uh, sovereign uh, Palestinian state uh, that's uh, living in peace and security next to uh, next to Israel. Sir. Yeah. Um, one, one more, and then we're going to have to break okay. up. My Go question's a, a little less emotive. Um, I wanted to ask about nonviolent resistance. Yeah. Um, there have been attempts in the Palestinian territories, yes. uh, Berlin, for example, where they have protests yes. on Friday. Yes. Um, and recently, it seems like, at least according to my friends on Facebook, a groundswell of interest in peaceful yes. nonviolence in the West Bank. Yes. And I was just wondering to what degree you think that might be a game changer? I think it could be a game changer. I think uh, there was an op-ed in the New York Times this week by uh, uh, Mustafa Barghouti, a very distinguished physician, uh, on that same subject. That the, 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 up until now, uh, the, the Palestinian resistance, the Palestinian uh, uh, fight for their, for their independence has not been based on, on Gandhi and, and Martin Luther King. Uh, it's been based on, in UN speak, armed struggle. That means, you know, fighting uh, and, and killing. Of uh, uh, one kind or another, and I think uh, there is a growing feeling that, the, the, especially because the Second Intifada is such a disaster uh, for everyone, uh, and so many people were killed, and that led to the construction of the wall and the, the separation barrier and all kinds of other problems. That um, uh, the way to go is is, is nonviolence, um, and I think um, I think that is uh, I think that's a growing growing trend in in the, in the territories.